Uh, I'm very happy to introduce Colin Wilson from Johns Hopkins University. Um, very well known for his work in phonology. Uh, done a lot of work on the architecture of the grammatical system uh, as it pertains to sound systems. And um, he's been moving increasingly towards phonetics, and we'll hear about some of that work today. So, Thanks, Paul. Thanks, guys, for showing up. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk about constrained temporal variation. And um, please feel free to interrupt me whenever you want. Um, this is a quote from the late, great um, phonetician Peter Latifoged. So he says, as phoneticians have long known, um, the sound symbolized with I or E in English is not the same as E in Danish. And he had a, a student he worked with who showed this quantitatively. Um, this is very charitable of him because, of course, not all phoneticians know this. This phonetician didn't know that. And if you're raised on the International Phonetic Alphabet, I think that when you find that out at first, it comes as some, somewhat of a surprise. Um, and it's certainly been most studied in the case of vowels. But if you look at uh, many different types of sound measured um, in many ways, either articulatorily or acoustically or both, you find that the same speech sounds um, differ. So um, certainly for vowels, but also for fricatives. And there's a really nice study by Jimmy Harnsberger on nasal consonants that uh, demonstrates this across closely related languages. Still, their nasals are measurably and perceptually different um, for lexical tone and so forth. And today I'm going to talk about um, the first case I'll talk about is stop consonant voice onset time. Um, it gets worse because um, even within a language, the same sound is not realized the same way phonetically. And uh, again, um, this sort of field of research um, started by looking at uh, vowel um, resonant frequencies or formants almost exclusively, and in some cases relating that to articulation, some, in some cases finding articulatory differences that don't have much effect on the formants. Um, and, but it's been extended to fricatives and liquids and all those other sounds that were on the preceding slide. And again, I'm going to talk about VOT in this case. And there's been a, there's been a few studies of voice onset time variation across talkers internally to English, but it's been considerably extended by my um, graduate student, Eleanor Shadroff, who's now a postdoc at Northwestern. So most of the work here will be based on what she did in her dissertation. There are a lot of sources of this phonetic variation, let's say, um, w within a language. So there are differences in the way that uh, uh, men and women um, uh, phonetically realize the same speech sounds. Um, some people have claimed that the sort of voice onset time variation that I'll talk about today is related to your lung volume. So that may co-vary with um, gender or sex, but not be the same as it. Um, the variation in form is well known um, to be due to vocal tract length differences. Some speakers may hyperarticulate more than others. They may enunciate more carefully than others. Um, and then there are a ton of social factors. So um, belonging to a gender as a social group as opposed to having a particular sex has an effect on your, on your speech. So for example, young boys start to talk their speech sounds starts to sound more like men um, way before puberty. So they're they're belonging to a particular group, um, particular social group, even before they uh, are mature. Um, and so anyway, in socio um, phonetics and socio linguistics, there's a study of all these all these various factors, um, most of which I know nothing about. But anyway, there there they are, there they are. Um, I want to take a sort of different view of this variation. So a lot of the work that's represented here has focused on um, in detail showing how much variation is present. Um, and I, that's, that's certainly true. And what I want to focus on is whether there are any constraints, any limitations or laws that restrict the, the variation across people. So it could be the case that phonetic realizations of different sounds, different speech sounds, um, that, they, that they vary independently across languages and speakers. Um, but I'll show that uh, for the two case studies today, 
that if you um, look at multiple sounds as produced by um, the same group of people, you find that those sounds vary a lot across the people, but they co-vary to a really um, strikingly a strong extent. So they don't vary independently. Um, and so I'll, I'll be showing in various ways that although languages and more to the point here, speakers vary a lot in the absolute values that they have for various phonetic parameters. Um, the patterns that they, uh, along those parameters or dimensions that the different speakers show um, are very similar. So um, I'll just start by talking about the VOT case and then if we have time or interest or whatever, we can talk about um, vowel duration too. Um, most of the data I'm gonna talk about today comes from this corpus of American English called Mixer 6. And it has many more than 180 native speakers in it. But Eleanor, for the purposes of her dissertation, um, carefully audited and cleaned up the corpus for, for about 180 of the talkers. And so I think that effort's ongoing, so there may be as many as 300 plus now. And it's not perfectly gender balanced. There are more female than male. Um, there's a wide range of ages represented all the way up to 86. Um, dialects are not very well represented, so most people are from Philly. These are connected speech recordings. So these are fluent speech recordings, not of individual words, but of, but of sentences that were read. And I'm trying to remember off the top of my head what the origin of the sentences was. I can't quite remember. But anyway, the sentences came from some previous corpus, maybe Mixer 5 or whatever. And each speaker was recorded over three sessions. We, we won't look at the session variable today, but just so we know that there's uh, a substantial amount of speech per person. OK? So we um, processed this by aligning the audio to the transcript of the sentences they were in, intended to read um, with a standard hidden Markov model toolkit with a fancy wrapper called the pen force delighter. And then the particular phonetic variable that we'll focus on first was measured by this tool that was built for that purpose called, called auto VOT or auto VOT. And I don't, I don't know if, but anyway, there's a small industry within linguistic phonetics now of building tools, standalone tools for taking measurements that were previously taken by graduate students and their undergraduate RAs um, <laughs> over the course of years. So we're trying to get this to happen faster um, and accurately. So um, every, is everybody here you know already about stop VOT or should I? Anyway, I can just say a little bit about it. So these um, consonants, which we'll be focusing on for the most part in the first part of the talk, pa, ta, and ka, these voiceless aspirated stop consonants, are produced by spreading the vocal folds. And um, that spreading delays um, vocal fold vibration in a following vowel. And we'll be looking at that delay. And that delay is an instance of what's called voice onset time. So it's the time between the release of the stop constriction. You can imagine a, a P where it's constricted and then released. It's the time between that point of release and when the voicing begins. And it is the primary perceptual cue that people use to distinguish pa, ta, and ka from ba, da, and that should be ga. Sorry for the typo. Okay, so pa, ta, and ka have longer VOT values. We'll look primarily at them, but I have a little bit of data about ba, da, and ga, the so-called voice stops, if you're interested in those. Um, I can just show you an example from the corpus, if it'll do it. Um, if it'll let me open it. Hmm. Oh, there we go. So this is an example of the word patch from the, from this Mixer 6 corpus. And I don't know why. Maybe it's in a question. I don't know why it has that rising intonation. Anyway, this would be the measurement of, v, of VOT. So this sharp pop here is the release of the P. And then there's a delay between that and the start of the voicing. And then, of course, one can always quibble about exactly when the voicing begins, right? Some people like to look at the first or second, even second formant. Some people like to look down here at the voice bar. And um, this was a case that was um, automatically measured with, with this tool, Autovot, that I mentioned before. Um, some, some cases were hand measured by Eleanor. Uh, so let me try to go back into slide sh presenter view. OK. So when we uh, measure 
the voice onset time for every instance of a given speaker in this mixer six, six corpus saying aspirated, voiceless aspirated P um, at the beginning of a word. And I think uh, in particular at the beginning of, of a word that stress initial has stress on the first syllable, we get a wide range of mean values. So this histogram represents those means across talkers. So this goes up to about 25 or so, 24, okay? So every, every one of the points that's reflected in this histogram is just an average value, one per person. And then so the overall sort of population average in our data is 51, and that's close to what it should be. That's similar to the values that have been found in other corpora of this connected speech type. Um, of course, we can say, play that same game with aspirated T and aspirated K. Just take all of the aspirated T's that occur word initially in stress syllables and measure the VOT for each one for each talker and take the mean for each talker and plot the means as a histogram. And you'll see that the mean for T a little bit higher than that for P. And that's pretty systematic both internally to English and across languages that T and K tend to have slightly longer VOTs than, than P does. And the relationship between T and K. Question. What's it? Yeah, sure, of course. Yeah. Um, the drops on the, the T, uh, those are presumably the out of the Yes, I, I think that's true. So, Can you the yeah, so the, the, there, are some, there are some kind of art, artifacts in the histogram, these, these indents that you see, yeah. And I think that is an artifact of, of time bidding that's done by the auto VOT measurement tool. I don't remember. Uh, I, I don't. I don't think so. I don't think so. But um, and then it's kind of curious that it doesn't show up so much in the in the in the K. But um, but anyway, there is one here. And yeah, and you'll we'll see this. This has an even bigger effect on the on the vowel duration um, part that I'll talk about at the end, because um, I don't have a great automatic tool for measuring vowel durations yet. So I have to rely upon something that had a like a ten millisecond frame shift. So they're pretty coarse. Um, so far, so good. So uh, anyway, a lot of that sociophonetic work would, would be invested in trying to explain uh, or at least describe why an individual talker might have a uh, VOT for aspirated T up here as opposed to down here. And so men would tend to have shorter values than women. Um, you can see effects of age. Um, the... Uh, there are certainly dialect region effects on, on this phonetic, phonetic parameter. So it would be about um, characterizing where individuals fall on, um, within one of these histograms. Okay. Question. Yes. Would you expect to, so you mentioned word initial. Yes. Would you expect the patterns to be less clear if it's not word initial? Or is the primary condition that it's uh, stressed so Yes, so in other positions of the word, it would be difficult to measure, to take this measure at all. So if you had a word final T, let's say at the end of the sentence, there would be no following vowel. Um, no, and there, so yeah, pre so pre-vocalically. Pre pre so then, then it depends on the allophonic um, distribution in English. So for example, if there was an S preceding one of these consonants, so in a word like spot or stop, then the aspiration is much shorter, the VOT is much shorter, and um, well, well below um, 61 milliseconds, more like 0 to 10. And so it would definitely vary, and in those circumstances, I'm not sure how much speaker variation one could actually see, because the range is, is really restricted. If it were word initial, uh, if it were initial stop, but followed by an unstressed vowel, then you would get values that are similar to these, but not quite as long. Okay, so a word like uh, potato, for example, would have an aspirated P uh, with a substantial VOT um, around this value, but, but not quite as long. Yeah. And then there are cases like butter, where you have a T uh, between vowels um, post-tonically after the stress, where the difference between aspirated T and D is not made, or at least not made very clearly in English, and so you get much shorter values there. Yeah, so it, it varies uh, depending upon the position. Um, 
So what we were interested in looking at is whether there are relationships or, uh, across these histograms. So is it the case that an individual who has a shorter, overall shorter VOT for P on average also has a shorter VOT for T and for the other stops? And um, this is not a relationship that had previously been investigated. So people had previously looked to confirm that across languages, across speakers, aspirated P tends to have a shorter VOT than aspirated T and K. So they have looked at that kind of ordinal or rank relationship, um, but that's about as far as it had gone. Um, but when you plot these histograms against one another, um, you see really striking, strikingly strong um, covariation of the VOT um, uh, across speakers. So this is, for example, P on this axis and T on this one. Every point shows on the x-axis the mean for mean VOT for P for one talker and the and then on the y-axis the mean VOT for T for that same talker. And so there should be about 180 points reflected here. And you can see over um, a quite broad range that the relationship is is essentially linear. And um, so the correlation here is 0.83. And that's true for the other pairs as well. So this shows T and K, and this shows K and P. And so that, you know, the strength of the relationship varies, but it's, it's always above, above 0.8. Um, and so what we're seeing is that there's substantial variation in, in the expression of this aspiration or in the, in the measurement of VOT across speakers, but um, speakers don't choose, as it were, a average VOT value for these stops independently. They're making a, it's like a package deal, so they're making a choice about the aspirated stops as a whole. And these lines are not exactly lines of equality. They don't go through the origin exactly, but they're pretty close to being lines of equality. So. Um, as a first approximation, you could say that a given talker um, has the same average voice onset time for all three voiceless stops in this context. Word initially in stress syllables. It's not quite true, but it's close. Um, this is just a bigger version of, so these are the same top three figures that were above. This shows the relationship between the voiceless stops that we've been focusing on and the voice stops ba, da, and ga, and then the relationships um, within ba, da, and ga. So for ba, da, and ga, you get much shorter, um, you get much smaller ranges of VOT variation across people. Um, and therefore, you have less opportunity to see the kind of covariation. And, I, and I'm not actually convinced that there is a lot of covariation among, within, those, within those stops. Um, so it, it may be that that a speaker who has an extra short VOT near, near zero for duh also has it for ga, but um, the relationship is not nearly as strong as in the case of these voiceless stops. Yeah. Yeah. And it's well known that um, when you have a phonetic parameter like VOT um, that has, a, has, a, has some characteristic short values like those of ba, da, and ga, and some characteristic long values like those of pa, da, and ga, that there's a lot more freedom uh, in speaker and context um, ver dependency uh, for the long values. So speakers are free to lengthen the VOT uh, to their heart's content. Uh, they're not bumping up against any other, other sounds um, in the case of the voiceless stops. But for the, for the voice stops, for various reasons, some of them aerodynamic and some of them having to do with the, preserving the contrast be between the voice stops and the voiceless ones. For the voice stops, their range of permissible variation is much smaller, and therefore the opportunities to see covariation are limited. Okay, so there are a lot of other factors other than talker that affect your VOT. So when you speak more slowly, um, your VOTs are overall longer. So one can um, try to quantify speaking rate in very many ways. We looked at, for example, the duration of the following vowel. Um, so if your following vowel is tend to be shorter than your preceding voiceless stops tend to have longer VOTs. Um, like I mentioned before, females tend to have longer VOTs than men, just on average. 
And then a ton of other factors. So um, VOTs tend to be um, longer preceding high and tense vowels like E, as in P, um, than they are in low and lax vowels like in PA. And um, if uh, the, the voiceless aspirate stop is the beginning of a word with with only one syllable, then the VOT tends to be longer than if it's at the beginning of a polysyllabic word, and that's just because um, all the sounds are shortened in polysyllabic words relative to monosyllables, with bisyllables falling somewhere between um, voiceless stops that are utterance initial, not just word initial, but utterance initial, um, or after a pause, uh, they tend to have longer VOTs than, than the ones that are medial or uh, medial in the sense. Um, more frequent words tend to have, I don't know, do you want to guess? More frequent words tend to have longer or shorter VOTs. Shorter, right? So the shorter words get uh, compressed durationally. Um, and also words that um, are highly similar to many other words tend to have longer VOTs maybe to preserve the phonetic difference between them, although that's a matter of dispute. So we tried to control for all of these other factors as well as we could, and we were um, aided in doing this, and, uh, especially, especially with respect to the utterance position and the word, the, le the lexical variables, in the fact that all of the speakers in the corpus said the same sentences. So we have them recorded saying the same words in the same sentence positions. That doesn't mean they're prosodically identical, but we have all the same following vowels, all the same syllable counts, and so forth. Could you control the stress? I didn't see it in that. Yeah, so stress is something we, we use to limit what stops we would look at. So we only, yeah, did we control for stress? Yes, we only looked at the stops that were in um, at the beginning of stress syllables. And then it turned out that, well, we've, we've sort of followed up on this recently in a short paper looking at VOT and a lot of other properties of stops, the burst spectrum, and, and the, to, to the extent that we could, uh, the, the, F is the, the fundamental frequency of the following vowel and so forth. And there we didn't limit it to stress syllables and we still found really striking patterns that, look, that still look like this. It's, it's just that you know, if it's an unstressed syllable, then the, on average you'd be lower on this, on this scale. Yep. Okay, so this seems to be um, a genuine uh, speaker level um, phonetic variable. So speakers vary in their VOT, even taking into account all of these other properties. And it, it holds separately within the genders, just as it holds across them, as I've been showing before. And, um, and we definitely know that this is a phonetic variable that speakers um, can control. Different, different languages vary in the, in the average duration of, the, of their VOT. So we know this is under speaker control, but speakers are not controlling this variable independently for each of the aspirated stops they're, they're doing. They're controlling it um, for all of them together. So there are a couple of offshoot, offshoots of this first study. So we looked to see whether this kind of relationship holds um, among young children who, who are living, uh, uh, who are learning English. So this is not our data. This comes from a, um, an, a, a corpus that's available that was collected at Ohio State and, and other, other universities. So publicly available corpus of um, child speech. And they have other languages, Korean, Japanese. They have several other languages in this, in this um, corpus. So we looked at 81 children about gender balance from 2 to 5. And again, if you, if you look at their pronunciations of K, aspirated K, and a word initially, and aspirated T word initially, you find variation uh, among the children, and, but you find the, a similar covariation pattern, so that um, each point here represents one child, and where one child falls on the T distribution is, is pretty predictive of where she or he fall on the K distribution. And that's true if you break it down by age. So the two-year-olds had a correlation of about 0.79, the threes of about 0.73. There's a little dip at four where the correlation is 0.6, and we um, haven't come to a good understanding of why there's that change, change at four. Okay, it could be the sample may be slightly smaller. I don't, I don't think that's right. Um, but anyway, so it seems like across most ages, and certainly at five, they're showing something very similar to the adult pattern. Yeah, yeah. So 
it's not. We yeah. Tend to balance. We yeah. Have sample right. Sample. Yeah, that's right. So on average, our sample would be about 20 if you just divide it by four, and then um, and then um, yeah, the gender balance would not be exactly the same there. That's a good. That's a good question. Yeah, it's a small n issue. Let's hope, or maybe there's something interesting that happens at four. I'm not sure. Okay, and then, um, well, we got intrigued, and we wanted to know whether the same covariation pattern that we find uh, within the speech of, a, of uh, American English adults and within children who are learning American English, whether you would find that on a global scale. So would you find that kind of covariation across languages as well? So we looked at um, published data of VOT means for um, 80 or so languages now. We're continuing to collect, but I think we've almost maxed out what the literature has conveniently available. Um, and what you find is if you look at, uh, for example, aspirated P, you, you take the languages that have that sound, because not all of them do. And you plot the mean VOT as reported in those studies, which are typically, I mean, to your small endpoint, typically based on very, very small number of speakers. Um, but we tried to match the environment as well as we could. So there were initial P's and pre-vocalic, et cetera. Um, you find, again, a range of, of values. And you, you find it sort of a short, shortish clump. You would call these short lag, voiceless aspirated stops. And then a, then a longer one. And I, there may be two actual um, parts of this longer lag distribution. And then things that are probably outliers, probably just uh, the speakers were talking especially slower, slowly, okay, for example, in those recordings. Anyway, you find quite a range of VOT values across languages in the same way that we saw across speakers. The range is slightly bigger. And that's true for all three of the aspirated stops. So, for example, in American English, you might find that the average VOT is roughly 60 milliseconds, 65 milliseconds across speakers. But in other languages, such as Navajo, the VOTs are, are much longer than that. They can be over 100 milliseconds. So, I and mean, then it's still, it's still other languages. In Danish, for example, you have slightly shorter VOT than you have in English, maybe around 50 milliseconds. So, but when you look at the relationships among the VOTs of the different stops, now cross-linguistically, um, you find, a, you find a, a, a pretty strong relationship. So this is for, um, the, this is the relationship between ba and da down here. And so these are negative values that we haven't seen before. The positive values that we've been focusing lie up here. So um, confusingly, the sounds ba and da in English would lie right about here. Um, but this upper range um, includes the pa and ta tokens that we were, uh, the type of pa and ta tokens that we were looking at from English before. So this is the um, labial stops against the coronal. These are the coronal against the dorsal and the labial against the dorsal. And in each case, you see these, these strong um, covariations. So again, we, we know that VOT for these stops is under speaker control. Uh, we know that it varies among speakers within the same language and to a larger degree across, across languages, but um, each stop does not represent an independent um, parameter of cross-speaker or cross-linguistic variation, the, the, the stops pattern together. Yeah. And I think this just quantifies it for, so for the long lag stops of the type that we um, were looking at in English, the aspirated stops, the correlations across languages um, are 0.7 to 2.8. Okay, so very very strong covariation. For this sample, we we are not able to control because we don't have the original recordings. We just have the reported VOT means. We're not able to control the gender, or I think more to the point, we're not able to control the speaking rate. So what that means is that the range of VOT variation that's represented in these plots across languages may not actually be as extreme. So if you remember that quote from Peter Ladefogel at the beginning, what you know, English E is not the same as Danish E. Um, it's true that English pa is not the same as other languages pa. How much they vary is not easy to determine from this sample. We know they vary 
by a certain amount and that they co-vary within that variation, but we, we're not able to factor out a lot of other effects that we would like to yet. Okay, so across speakers, ages, and languages, the same sounds, let's say the voiceless sound stops and the voice stops, they vary considerably on this phonetic dimension of VOT. However, the variation is tightly constrained within the sound classes. So the voiceless stops tend to have not perfectly identical, but very similar VO, average VOTs um, within a person, or if you average across people within a language. And the same is true, although to a weaker degree for the voice stops. Uh, within language, at least, we can show that this covariation of VOT is not reducible to speech rate or gender or dialect or position in the word, number of syllables in the word, and so forth, because we've, we've been able to hold a lot of those things constant or model them out. And um, then similar patterns are found in child um, children learning English and then with the provisos that I just gave across 80 or more languages. So... This is um, as close as I know to a phonetic law that the VOTs of voiceless stops co-vary um, that I know. Uh, the closest that I know to a law that's not reducible to something anatomical, or at least not obviously anatomical, okay? Because we know that, for example, bilingual speakers can have longer VOT values for one language than another. So their anatomy is not determining what VOT values they have. And in, in principle, they could mix and, mix and match the VOTs that we find uh, to be characteristic of different languages. They could have a long one for P, like you find in Navajo, and a short one that you find in Danish um, for T, and uh, you know, an even shorter one for K. But they don't do that. They, they tend to keep their phonetic systems consistent within a language. Yes? So if this is consistent yeah. uh, across languages, would you be able to see that as a marker for level of non-nativeness? Ah, oh, that's interesting. Have sort of a, a mismatch VOT. Yeah, yeah. So, so could non-native, could um, a mismatching, uh, a, a departure from this pattern be an indicator of non-native VOT? And I think that's a, that's a really cool idea. I think it's more likely that what you'll find is that a speaker of English who's trying to learn Navajo will not reach the height of the Navajo VOTs, but all of their VOTs will be shifted up by a certain amount. Maybe they'll split the difference to 90 when they're attempting to speak Navajo. And there's some really interesting effects in bilinguals when they travel to one, one country uh, that speaks where one language is spoken and then come home, their VOT distributions gradually drift um, from one language to another, regardless of which language they're speaking. Um, but I think there may be opportunities for using this type of phonetic measurement and others for characterizing disordered speech, Dis low-level dysarthric speech or other types of speech disorder. So that's, kind of, that's a kind of angle I've been thinking about in relating this to broader patterns of skilled motor control, where there are other kind of studies of of disorders, um, but I like that idea. So, um, so like I said, in principle, the variation in VOT could have been independent for each stop within limits that are set by your anatomy. So anatomy is not destiny in phonetics, so there could have been more vo variation, more independent variation that we, than we found. And so this, the fact that there is covariation indicates a kind of principle that relates um, cognitive or mental representations of sounds to their physical realization, something that says, for example, if these two sounds have a shared property of voicelessness, then their physical realization should be tightly yoked. Not exactly the same, but uh, uh, the, the difference between them should be minimized. And um, there are opportunities for using this covariation to understand effects that are found in speech perception and in what's called speech accommodation. So, for example, if I play you... Uh, a speaker, recordings of a speaker who has a relatively long K VOT. And then I ask you to say the same or other words that you heard that speaker say. Your um, natural K, K VOT, if it were shorter than that speaker's, will be elevated slightly. So you'll accommodate to their phonetic habits. And you will extend that to other voiceless aspirated sounds that you didn't hear that speaker say. So extend it, to, for example, to P. So you'll raise your VOT a little bit. 
And so why would you extend a pattern that your value that you've directly perceived for K, why would you extend it to P? Well, presumably because you know that a talker who has a relatively long KVOT is very likely to have a longer value for P as well. So if you want to accommodate to that talker's phonetic system, you want to raise all of the VOTs by a little bit. And this has been shown in perceptual, um, just straightforward perceptual way as well. If I present you with tokens of, of aspirated K from a talker who has a relatively short VOT, for example, and then I play you a continuum of VOTs for P, and I ask you which one of these examples would be characteristic of that talker, you will tend to select the shorter one. Not because you heard that speaker say that sound, but because, again, you, you infer that if you have a short VOT for K, you're likely to for P. And, um, of course, there's a long um, uh, tradition of having um, adaptive speech um, recognition systems and the kind of linear relationships that we're uncovering just is just a very simple type of, of linear um, adaptation to a new talker. So just, it could be as simple as um, for a new talker, uh, determine how much you should add or subtract from the expected VOT values um, for, these, for these voiceless stops. So just as simple as a speaker-specific offset. Okay. So the second case study, and I'll try to go through it just a little bit more briefly, has to do with vowel duration. So vowel duration is, um, it co-varies with VOT, but not to a really smashing extent. So uh, vowel duration is interesting to study independently of VOT, and it's, it's conditioned by a large number of factors. So stressed vowels are shorter or longer than Unstressed vowels, vowels at the beginning of, a, of an utterance are longer than those at the, in the middle. Um, words with many syllables tend to have shorter vowels. Um, in English, when you have a voiced consonant like D after a vowel as in the word bad, the vowel is longer than it is um, when, uh, a following voice, when there's a following voiceless stop as in bat. Um, more frequent words have shorter vowels and so forth. So there's really a long line of research on vowel duration per se. And the part that I'm going to focus on today is what's called intrinsic vowel duration. Um, intrinsic to, to it's, it's a property of the vowel um, distinct from its, its context or who's speaking it. And so that refers to um, a finding that's true of English and cross-linguistically that vowel duration um, correlates with vowel height. So high vowels such as E and U uh, tend to be shorter slightly than mid vowels such as a and o, and those are in turn shorter than low vowels a and a. Well, this has been known um, for a long time, and um, it was well documented for several languages by Lahista and, uh, and many others, and there have been big debates about whether speakers um, intend to produce a and a um, with longer durations than, than E and U, or whether it somehow falls out of the um, anatomy physiology of speaking. And the going idea, as, as just demonstrated, is that your jaw has to move further uh, lower to produce an ah, the low vowels, than it, than it does in, in E and U, uh, on average. And so it may be that just the further you have to go, the longer it takes you, and that doesn't turn out to be quite true, but, um, but surely there's some sort of relationship there. Um, so um, we've, we, we've been looking at intrinsic vowel duration patterns across speakers, and I wanted to start out with something that's more typical of phonetic studies even now. So this is um, speakers producing vowels in isolated consonant vowel consonant syllables. So they're saying these syllables, not completely in isolation, they're saying them in little frames, say whatever the syllable is again. Okay, and they're speaking very slowly, they're, they're not producing real sentences, and there's a relatively small number of speakers, so 24, which is pretty characteristic of this type of phonetic study. And so um, I've switched to the ARPABET symbols here as opposed to IPA, so here's E, uh, which is a high vowel, and here's A, which is low, 
and then it's e, and then i, which is lax, a, e, which is lax, a, 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 if the speakers have a, and o and u. And um, duration is plotted so that um, higher values are lower, uh, just because that matches up better with the typical way of showing high values higher in the ch high vowels higher in the chart than low vowels. And each of these thin red lines is a talker's uh, represents a given talker's mean values. So each talker has a mean duration for e and all the other vowels. Here's one of those talkers, and so they have a pattern that they display across the vowels of intrinsic vowel duration. And if you look at the pairwise correlations amongst those patterns, um, the mean is 0 0.92, the, the lowest is, is 0 0.76, and so forth. Um, when I rounded, the max was 1, but I know you're not going to believe me when I say that. So the max is 0 0.99. So anyway, these different talkers obviously have different uh, vowel durations, and that, that might be an indication of their overall differences in rates of speech. But they're preserving... Um, the pattern where the, the high vowels tend to be shorter than, than the low vowels, and even within the high vowels, the difference between the tense e and the lax i is pretty well preserved across, across speakers. Yep. And the tense a mid vowel versus the lax e, pretty well preserved. So that's from an older study that Eleanor and I had done on VOT, which also yielded this nice uh, small amount of VOT data. Now, when we go back to Mixer 6, uh, where we have, I think I actually looked at 200 plus speakers for this, for the purposes of this demonstration, not that one could resolve those lines anyway, but you find, um, so the vowels are ordered the same way, again, higher durations are plotted lower, um, the duration should be shorter, it, because this is continuous speech production of whole sentences as opposed to those semi-isolated syllables. And um, within the high, high vowels and the mid vowels, you find very similar patterns. And then uh, th I think there's kind of a gray area here. It's not really so clear to me that all of the low-ish vowels are patterning exactly the same way. Uh, but when you take the correlation, the pairwise speaker correlation of these um, patterns, you find an average of, of 0.9 to, again, a very high max. But then the min goes, goes down quite a bit. And um, that could be because the alignment between the speech and the transcript of the sentences was done fully automatically. There was no hand, no hand measurement of any, of any of the vowels in this case. So some of the vowels may just be completely mis, mismeasured, throwing off this, this pattern. Um, it's also the case that some of the speakers did not say all the sentences that one intended to, so you may have less, fewer data points for some of them. But I, I really need to check out. So the, the, the first quantile is point, point 0.9, so I should really check out what's going down, on down in this, this uh, low correlation part. Um, so there's sort of intrinsic, you know, a couple of other findings here. So um, if you try to warp, uh, if you take the average over all these patterns uh, within one of the corpora, either the isolated syllable or the connected speech corpora, and you try to find a way of warping one speaker's pattern to that uh, population average. It turns out you can do that in either of two equivalent ways. So you can have just a, just a shift on the durational axis. So just shift the individual talker's pattern up or down so that it best aligns with the population means. Um, or you can have a kind of scaling, you can imagine, of kind of shrinking or uh, expanding or contracting of the talker-specific pattern. Those, those tend to be, those seem to be uh, approximately equivalent ways of normalizing um, a given talker's intrinsic vowel duration to the population pattern of intrinsic vowel duration with one parameter. And so the root mean squared error goes, you know, goes down with either one of those one parameter Warps, if you do both, it doesn't really go down much further. So maybe there's some cleverer way of doing talker normalization on this durational uh, dimension, but the flat-footed way is working pretty well. And that's true for both the isolated speech and the connected speech. So this is just like the average RMS, or root mean squared error, um, uh, uh, 
when you treat every talker as uh, the same, you, you just say that every talker is trying to produce the population pattern, obviously the talkers vary, so that, that's not going to be perfectly true. There's going to be some error, and that error goes down if you allow the, uh, a, a single degree of freedom per speaker that is an offset or a multiplier. Mm? Um, question. So I think you said that you, one of the differences may yeah. be that the isolated syllables have a, a cleaner measurement. Yes, it's done by hand. Do you have enough data in the connected speech to extract only CVC? Samples and look at those? Yeah, so um, one of the things that, uh, um, so there are a lot of virtues of the Mixer 6 corpus. The um, part that I would change if I were going to redo this, the, the whole construction of that corpus is to increase the lexical variety. So there are very f relatively few lexical types. So when I say that we're looking at the average asp um, duration of aspirated P or the average duration of the stress vowel E, um, I really mean in a, in a handful of words, so maybe, maybe 10 or, or 20. And there won't be a lot of CVCs, yeah. But there'll be some. I should, I should look at that for sure. I should try to break it down a little bit further. Um, I've talked the whole time as if it's proper to characterize sp speaker differences in terms of the means only. But of course, every speaker has a, has a distribution of VOTs or has a distribution of durations of, a, of vowels in general or, or of a particular vowel such as E or A. And um, I've been looking at the within speaker variation a bit as well. And it turns out that no matter which distribution you choose, as long as it's unimodal and has a heavy, a right, heavy tail to the right, it will fit the within um, speaker and within sound variation quite well, so there can be gamma, log normal, etc. And it turns out that the, the, um, the size of the variation closely tracks the mean value. This is another reflection of the fact that when you have a phonetic parameter, the longer the mean value is, the more variation is allowed, so you just get ever longer values. And so it does seem appropriate to think of talkers differing in, um, in VOT or in vowel duration, um, to think of those talker differences as being well characterized by a single parameter, which affects all members of a class, such as pa, ta, and ka, or the stressed vowels, and that shifts the mean, or something closely related to the mean, and has a consequence that it increases the variance as well. So if you, if you look at the covariation the co between the mean and the, and the standard deviation or the, or the variation, uh, I mean, it's almost perfect in the case of VOT and in, these, in the case of these vowel durations. So you don't really need to learn two things about a speaker, just, just one. So again, you, know, you find these intrinsic um, durations that differ considerably across people, but the vowels don't vary independently. You find highly similar duration patterns across individuals. And we know that vowel duration is, um, is a temporal parameter that's independent to a certain extent of the other one I talked about, VOT, and it's definitely under speaker control. So for example, there can be languages in which there's a contrast between a short E and a long E. So definitely speakers could make their E longer if they, if they wanted to. They could make, the, one speaker could choose to have a quite long E while still having a shortish A. Ah. And that would break that speaker out of this intrinsic vowel duration pattern and make that speaker disagree with the population pattern to a considerable extent. But speakers don't exercise that degree of freedom, or at least not in English. Um, they're all sticking closely to the pattern modulo some offset or scaling factor. Um, we know that vowel duration is not the most important cue for distinguishing one vowel from another, but for some vowel differences or contrasts, it can be important. So for example, the difference between a eh and a eh is spectrally somewhat marginal or at least variable across speakers and listeners will use the difference between uh, the duration, uh, they will use the duration of a vowel to try to perceive this distinction so they'll assign shorter tokens to a eh than they will to a eh if you neutralize the spectral differences. And again, it looks like as far as the models of adaptation that you would use for speaker independent um, talker recognition, you could have a, a relatively simple adaptation parameter for shared across all the vowels uh, for a speaker. So you needn't hear 
the speaker say all of the stress vowels of English in order to know how to adapt on this dimension. You hear some of them, you sort of get a, a feel for where they fit within this pattern of variation, and you can easily extrapolate to the durations of the, of the out-of-sample vowels. And there's every reason to believe that human perceivers can do the same thing. So um, I'll just, I'll wrap up. So um, we know that um, there's substantial variation in the physical realization of sounds across languages and, the, and then across speakers within a language, some of it due to straightforward um, anatomical differences, such as the length of the vocal tract, but um, always the, the length of the vocal tract and other anatomical properties only determine, as Francis Nolan was uh, really good at showing, only determine a range of values that you as an individual can produce. And within that range, you have a, it would seem you have a great degree of, um, many degrees of freedom. And so this has been studied for um, ages now in the cases of vowel resonant frequencies or formants. And, but the finding has been that speakers within a language don't exercise all the degrees of freedom that are available to them. So they all produce a similar pattern, sorry, it's tilted in this case, a similar pattern of, of high vowels and their formants arranged relative to low vowels, for example, plotted um, in, in, in um, log hertz. And so um, different speakers have um, essentially the same vowel pattern that is shifted around, okay, on, a, on an individual basis within this space. Um, so anyway, most of the work, most of the previous work that has shown this type of constrained variation has been on vowels and on vowel, formant, vowel formants in particular. Um, and what we're doing is pushing this work um, into consonants and into away from just spectral properties to temporal as well. And so what I've tried to show today is that um, um, covariation uh, holds uh, within these temporal properties of VOT and inherent vowel duration. It's just as systematic and as consistent across speech styles as the well-known um, vowel, vowel formant variation. And so there are plenty of other properties of the of the consonants to look at, and part of Eleanor's dissertation was on speech a class of sounds that I didn't talk about, uh, the fricatives. So, for example, sun, za um, have similar places of articulation, and um, that results in a characteristic centroid frequency of the frication. And sure enough, individual speakers vary in their um, centroid frequency for, for S, so some people are more like Humphrey Bogart and it sounds more like sha, sha, and some people have really high s, s, s's, and their z's fall right along. So if you are a speaker with a low centroid frequency s, you're likely to, be, to have a low uh, centroid frequency for z as well. And there's nothing anatomically necessary about that. It's part of the phonetic expression of the phonological relationship between those sounds. So these are the directions. So for the vowel duration part in particular, I need to model out all those additional sources of uh, uh, all those additional uh, additional tweaks to the vowel duration in addition to the individual speaker. Um, vowels have intrinsic F zeros, just as they have intrinsic durations, and I've started to look at the covariation of those intrinsic vowel pitches. And there's tons to look, look at in the vowels, and, and Eleanor is working some more on the fricatives. So then there's sort of this kind of grand challenge or big picture questions, which is um, how few dimensions can we have that uh, in order to capture the vast majority of these cross-speaker phonetic differences? So uh, vocal tract length norm normalization or the, you know, some approximation of the length of the vocal tract is one parameter that's well known and it has an effect on the vowel formants. But today I've been speaking about two additional parameters, one having to do with the aspirated stops, one having to do with the vowels and their duration. So I don't know how many parameters there are for this space of speakers, even internal to, to one language. Of course, we'd like to have as few parameters as possible, but I don't know what the, what the ultimate size will be, maybe 20 or so. And then um, you find similar um, differences and within... Uh, individual distributions of uh, uh, in other areas of skilled motor control. So you find other 
temporal variation amongst individuals and variation within an individual that has the same sort of long right tail shape. And so um, a question of interest is whether there are uh, relationships um, across the skilled motor behavior of individuals um, that would transcend the, the uh, speech. So for example, if you look at handwriting, people have different um, characteristic stroke shapes, but also stroke durations, and be worth looking to see whether the, there are relationships between um, that type of skilled motor control and, and speech on an individual basis. Thank you. Yes. So, um, does it make any sense to ask about correlations between VOT on the one hand and vowel length on the other within a single speaker? Is if, if you're long on VOT, are you more likely to be long on vowels or going over the reverse? Uh, or is that just not a sensible question to even ask? Um, that one's a sensible question, and it has a um, a positive answer. So the question is, does it make sense to look at correlations across the different dimensions that I've been talking about or others that one might study? And in the case of VOT and vowel duration, it does make sense, and one will find a, a modest correlation between those two. Both of them reflect speaker differences in overall speech rate. So I think if you measured essentially any any property of the of the speakers, you would find that kind of covariation. But Speaking rate is carried more by the vowels than it is by the consonant properties. And some people claim that as speaking rate um, uh, gets slower, actually the vowels lengthen and the consonants shorten. But I don't, I don't think that's true of VOT in particular. All right, VOT slows down with the vowel duration. We've looked at correlations amongst many properties for the same talker or the same speech sound. So. Um, you, you don't find correlations, as far as we can tell, between the VOT duration and the duration of the talker's fricatives. Um, we don't find strong covariation co between VOT duration and spectral properties of the consonants, the burst spectrum, the release spectrum. So it makes sense to ask. There's no principled reason that I know of that the answer would be yes, but... Um, and in fact, we don't, we don't find many of the correlations that we have looked for. So it seems that there's a, a pretty tight relationship between um, the phonological characterization of the sounds, the features that they have in common, and the strong phonetic correlations that exist amongst them on the dimensions that are relevant for expressing those phonological features, um, modulo overall effects of speaking, right? I was partly thinking about feature systems that go for features that are shared between consonants and vowels. Yeah. So um, uh, height, I guess, is what comes to mind. Right. So uh, the parametric variations in how speakers mark height um, of consonants correlated all with height of vowels. Okay. Um, since you're interested in the sort of feature variation. Yeah, so um, one direction to take this whole work is to use the phonetic covariation patterns as evidence for particular phonological features. And um, there are different feature systems that would relate to the, for example, the consonants and the vowels. And if one were to find these phonetic um, covariation relationships um, in, in the way that those features would suggest, since those features have particular ways of being expressed phonetically, then that would be that would provide evidence for them. Of course, there are existing feature systems um, that assign no content to the features that distinguish um, different consonants from one another. So they would say just uh, T is plus F and D is minus F, but, but F has no, no meaning whatsoever. And so um, the way we've been thinking about the features is that they have a systematic relationship with the phonetic expression. So they have phonetic content, and therefore you get very similar content, or at least tightly related content um, across all the sounds that bear a particular feature. 
Yes. So, uh, I'm sorry if you're late. Like, I don't That's think we've already discussed it, but like, I wanted to know like, uh, if you could point out some of the use cases for this particular like, research in our field. Yes. So, um, in my field um, and in yours, um, the central use case is understanding how you can adapt to the phonetic pattern of a new talker with very little, with sparse training data. So how, how little, uh, how small an amount of speech do you need from a new talker to identify that she has uh, um, VOTs of this level as opposed to this one? or uh, of vowel durations of this type as opposed to the higher pattern. Um, because we know that humans can quickly um, create expectations about how um, a given speaker will produce uh, words and sounds that they have not heard the speaker say, from, from some, sometimes as little as one word, it seems. So hearing them say hello can um, give you a good, good um, uh, set of expectations about how to produce other, other words and other sounds. And I think that's also, or at least maybe I don't know, but anyway, at one point in time, that was also um, a concern in, in automatic speech, or spe speech recognition. How, how can you take a domain general model and adapt it to a new talker um, very quickly without extensive training on that new talker's voice? So it's, it's more for understanding perspective of the art, like identifying, identifying. art, is it more of like mimicking the way the, the, the agent, like the agent can mimic the user he's talking to, and if the second yes. is, is the case, then how correlated is to mimicking uh, the, the person you're talking to, to actually, is it, is it helpful in the sense that yeah. you're talking? That's a very good question. So how, how helpful is it for the... Um, for a, uh, an automatic system to mimic the speech habits of a, of a person? I don't know the answer to that question, and I think I can see it going either way, but we know that humans, when they speak with one another, um, do that mimicking or accommodation at a, at least a, a low level, but a, across many different phonetic, phonetic dimensions. And so if, um, if users... Uh, uh, feel good when the automated systems are more human-like um, and they're not getting into some phonetic uncanny valley, then they will prefer um, imitation, accommodation. If um, it freaks them out that the machines start to behave like humans and what are you, are you trying to sound like me? What are you taking over my identity? Then, um, then, yeah, then it will be a bad thing. But anyway, it is something that's very, uh, it's inevitable, it happens all the time in, um, in uh, uh, human conversation, so they may feel it's very natural. So on the production side, you do have there are cases where you want to have a celebrity text to speech words, for example, or someone sounding like you specifically. So for that, that might help to add that as a feature. Yeah, and so I think there are pretty, yeah, so this is a question about um, deliberately synthesizing speech to sound like a celebrity or just some, some individual. Mm -hmm. And um, I've heard some really sh surprisingly good um, versions of that recently. Mm -hmm. And it's of interest for me, um, since I would like to talk to, to the computer scientists and the speech, speech people as much as possible, it, it's of interest to me to know how they have parameterized the differences amongst talkers in order to get those systems to be so, so, so eerily accurate. And on the flip side, you, you could use it potentially as a low-cost adaptation to improve uh, speech recognition, right? Yes. Yeah, I think the intuition is that there's just a very... If you can map out the dimensions, that they're they're hopefully relatively few in number, and they go a long way. So they affect you know classes of sounds, vowels being a larger class than the aspirated stops, and that you could hear just a, a small sample of speech and estimate the warping factors that you need for for all the sounds jointly. Yeah, and that that's something that um, that uh, Cox and um, and uh, Fourier and others um, had worked on. So Cox in particular looked at linear, linear relationships among sounds on phonetic dimensions such as these. And he didn't look at VOT in particular, but he did look at vowel duration and other properties that, we, that we're focusing on now. And so that, 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 that idea has been around and that it's a pretty simple 
warping relationship to take a population pattern and turn it into the pattern for an individual. It's been around for quite a while. So, low cost, yeah. Yes? Uh, so, <clears throat> could you show? Uh, yeah, that, that's good. Or, or this one? Either, either one. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, there's the issue of how contributions from different dimensions interact with each other or combine. Yes. Right? So, it looks like uh, black spells are longer than ten spells, at oh. least when you hold constant. Sorry, sorry, tens. Tents are longer because oh, it's right. plotted down. Sorry, yeah, tents are longer and lax are shorter. Yep. Um, it's upside down. Yeah, it's upside down because that puts the low vowels low. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, but uh, you have an effect of height and you have an effect of tenseness, uh, and they have to be combined in a certain way. Uh, do you have any ideas or results about uh, whether you can go down to multiple levels, multiple feature level in? predicting vowel length uh, across the vowels, by combining effects of different features? So this is a question of whether, um, so in the case of, of VOT, I have focused on a feature that are shared by, um, in each case, three of the stops, so voiceless or, or aspirated and, and voiced, or voiceless and aspirated on the other hand. And the question is whether the features of the vowels can be used to um, to predict the uh, the vowel duration um, differences in the same way that the that the voicing features re were in the case of VOT, and um, so it's appealing to me, um, but I I'm not sure that I I see it exactly. So, uh, for example, what, one thing I've I've been wondering about is whether um, so e e i and u u are, are all high, the four high vowels of English. And um, they obviously do not all have the same vowel duration, but there are other features that distinguish them. So E and I are front, and U uh and U uh are back. And then within each of those pairs, the first one is tense and the second one is lax. So E is tense, as it, it is lax. And um, so it could be that I can use those three features to model the duration of those four vowels, but I'm not getting a lot of parameter reduction there. So I'm not going to be able to use only height, right, because they're all four high, but obviously they don't have the same vowel duration. And uh, I won't be able to use only lax, because um, on some accounts, ad may be lax, and certainly a, uh, well, as patterning, similar to them. Um, but similarly, A is, is A is tense, and it's it's much longer than E. So um, I, I think you can tie it to the features, but and I don't even know how I'm saying this, but English has too few vowels to, to get a, a, a large reduction in the a lot of, large bang for your buck per parameter. I think it's still worth worth looking at for sure. So it looks to me, I'm not sure, but it looks to me like ooh uh, tends to be longer than E. Um, on, a, on a per speaker basis, and that could be because U involves a considerable amount of lip rounding, and it maybe the lip rounding takes uh, contributes time. I'm not sure. Or it could be the difference in the in the <coughs> tongue body movement uh, between the. But there, so there is a feature that distinguishes them, uh, backness. But that's not in this list of you know. It's not in, not in the height dimension. Yeah. So I think there's more to find out about what intrinsic vowel duration really means, and what features control it. So, um, I guess we're kind of out of time. I have a couple of questions, but I'll take offline. Okay. So, Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks a lot for coming.